Oh, it's the end of the year and I'm a bit tired and these chairs are very comfy, aren't they? So, um, but fortunately I won't fall asleep because uh, the conversation we're going to have is going to be so interesting. Uh, good afternoon everyone, I'm Matthew Taylor, I'm Chief Executive here at the RSA. Delighted to welcome you to today's special event, which is our final event of the year. How many of you have been to more than one RSA event this year? Put your hands up. Okay. So this is something I do every year. Um, all our events are possible because we just have the most amazing events team here at the RSA, and they, everything they do is brilliant, and we've had the most fantastic series of events in the last few weeks in particular. I think we, how many events in the last three weeks? 20, 20 events in the last three weeks, and uh, people just put their hand up spontaneously, say so they've been at one of those. So I'd just like you to join me in thanking the RSA events team for another brilliant year for the RSA. And it's great that we're finishing on a high point. So, um, can you make sure your mobile phone is switched to silent, but you don't need to turn it off because you can join in the conversation on Twitter along with all the people who are watching us online. The hashtag is RSA uh, Leadership if you want to get involved in that conversation. Now, it's my great pleasure to welcome today's distinguished guest speakers, Pippa Malmgren and Chris Lewis. Um, Pippa is an economist, entrepreneur, and US policy analyst. She served as Special Assistant to the President of the United States, George W. Bush, for Economic Policy on the National Economic Council. She now advises the British government and several of the world's largest financial and military organizations. Chris is an entrepreneur and best-selling author who writes on creativity and business leadership. He's a former journalist and founder of Lewis, one of the largest creative agencies in the world. It's quite interesting. You're kind of quite opposed to kind of the big ego of leaders, but you've named your organization after yourself, Chris. I'm, I'm not, I, 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 I make no comment at all. Um, Anyway, they join us today to share, to share the thinking of their new book, uh, The Leadership Lab. Uh, in this book, they explore how better leadership can equip us to face the formidable challenge of today. By broadening our view of what leadership can and should be, they argue we can anticipate changes ahead and take on the unprecedented opportunities and threats we face in the 21st century. So uh, Pippa and Chris are going to do a kind of double act. Um, I'm going to ask them a few questions, and we'll open up to you, and we'll finish promptly at 2 o'clock. So please welcome Pippa and Chris. Well, thank you very much, uh, everybody, for giving up your time to, to, to come here on such a, a cold day. I, I hope you haven't just come in because it's uh, slightly warmer inside here than it is out there. Um, uh, before we pre present the, the research uh, that, we've, that we've gathered, it's probably uh, useful for us to just talk through a little bit about how we came about this and where it came from. And so, um, as Matthew mentioned, my background is, a, is as a journalist with the Financial Times and The Economist and other media organizations. And, and um, over the last three years, Pippa and I have traveled around the world uh, to cities like Singapore and to uh, Hong Kong and uh, uh, to, uh, San to San Diego, San Diego yeah. in America, Munich, <laughs> Amsterdam. And we specifically went out of our way to interview leaders of, of all different backgrounds. So that not, not, not just commercial leaders, or leaders in politics, uh, but also leaders in charitable organizations, uh, in the military, in the third sector, also in um, the clergy as well. And uh, we specifically wanted to go out there and look at the widest background of leadership to gather that information. So we spoke to a large number of people over a three year period, and of course things were changing during that period as well. And the conversations also reflected some of the priorities of the various uh, regions. But there were some very clear trends that, that came through. And, uh, and when, we come to, when we came to write this, we found that the, between the two of us, because I, I'm a, a Brit living in America, and, uh, and, and Pippa is an American who's living in London, uh, and we were looking at it from two different angles, from nationality and from two different genders, we were, then became immediately aware we were looking at problems in very different ways, but coming up with very similar uh, solutions. So that's the rubric from which we drew the research. And let's face it, over the last few years, what we've seen is an enormous crisis in leadership across every category. And as we looked and we said, all right, we have scandals in the Roman Catholic Church related to sex. We have the auto emission scandals. We have uh, lack of leadership in politics in many parts of the world. I mean, the list of leadership crisis is very, very long. And as we went and talked to leaders, because that's our core business, both of us are advising leaders, what we found is they were all saying the same thing. 
They said, I've been totally blindsided by what's happened. I am completely surprised. I can't get people to follow me. So we started to look at this. Why is it that they're so blindsided? And bringing them together and listening to them, we came to a few conclusions. One is that this model of the infallible, iconic leader, which is a very kind of 20th century idea, but it's a very historic notion, right? We, we jokingly call it the Jesus Christ model of leadership. You know, this one person who's infallible and we all follow. We do this throughout history, but actually maybe leadership in the 21st century isn't about the leader anymore. It's about the ship. It's about how to pull the talent and the skills and the capabilities of the entire organization together, and that's the skill set. Also, 20th century leaders, just like all of us, uh, we are very analytical people, right? We've all been trained in a kind of Western reductionist thought process that the answers are going to be in the numbers. And if we just have better Excel spreadsheets, we can get the number and we can get the answer. So what Chris and I concluded is the analytical skills of the 20th century, while they do serve an important purpose, now need to be balanced out by what we call parenthetical skills. That's the ability to look across the landscape, to connect the dots. It's one thing to measure the math, but if you don't have any comprehension of the mood, very difficult to lead. Uh, it's one thing to know the facts, different thing to know the feelings. So how to get leaders more comfortable with the softer side of the skill set that's now required. And the third thing that we found is that one of the reasons that these leaders are having trouble getting people to follow them is because they don't know where they are, literally. They are so busy and, and have been running organizations in such a way that they're often operating on assumptions that are quite literally almost, a, say, a decade out of date. So they'll say things like, all the jobs are moving to China. Now, I'm an economist, and I'm working with the biggest investors in the world, I'm working with the political leaders on economic issues. Actually, Mexico now has cheaper wages than China by 20 to 40 percent, and their quality control is American standard. So the Chinese are investing hugely in Mexico. And if you just Google the new airport they're proposing to build in Mexico City, you'll begin to see the magnitude of investment. Why? Because they've realized manufacturing in China is not competitive anymore. This is why the people who make your iPhone, Foxconn, the second biggest employer in China, has just completed building a new production facility in Wisconsin. Now, when Wisconsin beats Shenzhen, something big has happened. And if you say, I am clueless about this, I have no idea because I think all the jobs are going to China, it reveals that your what we call situational awareness is not very strong. That's a military term, but we realized it was applicable to leaders. And it's on many fronts. Uh, it helps explain why did the leaders in this country miss Brexit? A lack of situational awareness. Um, we have a big section in the book on um, technology. So many leaders say to me, Pippa, this is very interesting, all these things you say. How can I find out more about your views? I say, well, I put stuff up on Twitter all the time. They say, oh, I don't know how to open a Twitter account. And you're like, we're in a high tech environment where technology is moving at an incredible speed. We have a lot of leaders who say, I don't do tech. Yeah, well, then tech is going to do you. That's the bottom line. So the, we realize that the book is partly a kind of 360 view of the landscape. It's an ambitious project, but the reason we gave this big view was because we realized that a lot of our leaders don't actually know what is on the landscape. And then I'll, I'll pass to you for maybe the core point that we make on the book is diversity of thinking is the main thing that you're after. And, and we all support diversity of people and that plays a crucial part in getting to diversity of thinking, but diversity of thinking is actually quite a hard thing to achieve. So if you start saying, I am certain about where we're going, okay, now we're already in a problem. And uh, we spent a lot of time talking about how to bring about diversity of thinking. Yeah, I think that, that's, that's right. The, the, we came to the conclusion that where we were dealing with this infallible, almost reckless approach, 
that in these organizations where they had lied or cheated or deceived people, say, on the emission scandal or exchanged uh, aid for sex, that th these environments uh, weren't short of information or research or data, uh, but they were short of imagination, the imagination to consider that somebody actually might find, find them out or to discover wrongdoing. Uh, or to, to have the imagination of how what they could be doing might be interpreted as being a complete abrogation of their responsibilities and the values of the organizations that they, that they led. And so that led us to the conclusion, really, that the only provenance of leadership certainty must mean mediocrity. Mediocrity is the only provenance for that level of certainty uh, because real leadership these days lives in an environment of complete ambiguity because things can be true and false at the same time. And in the book, we identified eight paradoxes where something could be true and false exactly at the same time. So there is more information around, for instance, than ever before. But that information is, o is overloading people to such a great extent that the information now is actually making them less enlightened uh, because they don't want to appear, they don't want to listen to any other point of view except something that confirms the certainty of that, that view. And so these paradoxes are existing side by side, almost quantum superpositioned, that they're true and false. So you might make the statement, which is true, that Google pays all of its taxes. Uh, and, and, uh, but, but that's not necessarily true, depending on what, which way you interpret the law. And so those two things may be true and false at the same time. And people are increasingly skeptical of organizations that say, this is true, but they know it to be false. Take inflation, for instance, that's a good example that everybody says inflation is under control, it's not, it's not particularly high. But we all know that there is inflation because we know that, for instance, the products that we use are actually staying the same price, but they're getting smaller. You there's shrinkflation. You open your breakfast cereal and there's like less cereal inside, but Which the is, price is the same? So one of the people that we spoke to was a former leader at Unilever, that, and they make all the world's toothpastes. Mm -hmm. and, and we said that we think I, I call us nerds, but we think that you've changed the aperture on the toothpaste tube. And made it bigger. And do you know what he said? He looked at us and said, duh. <laughs> Just to be clear, you understand why this is important? Because if you have inflation, so all your input costs are going up, so you want to charge the consumer more and give them less so that you have a better margin. Well, the high, bigger the aperture, the, more, the quicker and more toothpaste is used. Um, you probably, anybody use perfume bottles lately where you see the dimple on the bottom of the bottle keeps getting higher and there's just less and less fluid in there? This type of thing. I mean, this, uh, it's getting... I no idea we were going here. It's, uh. it's, get, it's getting into nerdy detail, but it's very interesting because the toothpaste used to be spread along the top of a brush. And now with an electronic toothbrush, it has to be put into a P-shape. And that meant that people were using less of it. So they altered the viscosity of the toothpaste to make it more fluid so it would fall off more equally and open the aperture so that more would drop into the... Th and we felt this was a good example of how people were, were, were being told that there was no inflation, but people were obviously being, using more of the product. Exactly. So this is the thing. You know, in this country and in the United States, do people feel that their rent is going up? How many of you have kids who cannot pay their rent in London? Right? Everybody's got somebody who's like having struggle with this. And yet, you know, there's no inflation, there's no problem. So these kinds of disconnects are what lie at the heart of the breakdown of trust and confidence in experts, in leaders, and it's the exact sort of thing. It's a, it's a granular detail, but it occurs on so many different fronts. And that's what needs to be addressed, to reconcile what is actually happening in reality versus what you think. And that gap can be very, very wide. Um, also, this business of ambiguity is very important in the sense that we, we advise in the book to move away from prediction, right? How, I know as, a, as an economist, I expected that Brexit vote would happen and that Trump would win. Now, when I said that in advance of those events, people said, you are insane. This will never happen. Well, then it happened. So, Here's the problem with prediction. First of all, it's a mugs game, right? Your chance of getting it right are not great. Second, it's so binary in a world where there's a multitude of possible outcomes. And third, it leaves you vulnerable when you're wrong, you're really wrong. So instead, let's move away from prediction and move towards preparedness. Now, if preparedness is your goal, 
that's a very different approach to information management and team management. Because then when someone on your team says, I, I, think, I think the public might vote for Brexit, you say, OK, instead of shooting you down as an idiot, let's play with this idea. Let's think about this possibility. What would happen to the organization and the nation if this were to unfold? I remember uh, when, when the Brexit vote was taken, the prime minister's office at the time, um, I remember talking to a few of them and saying, you know, I think you should be prepared for the other side, for the other outcome. And they said, no, 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 no. Anyway, the prime minister has no speech prepared. Now, as a person who worked with the President of the United States, that is extraordinary to leave the leader of the nation without a speech in case in a, in a two-possibility outcome, you're only prepared for one. Right? This is a good example of why the shift to preparedness thinking is so important, especially in such a fast-moving environment where technology is completely changing the landscape. Another trend that we saw amongst these leaders also was that many of them had got into a position uh, of, uh, of leadership by being very uh, competent. Uh, they had to-do lists as long as your arms. Anybody here got a to-do list? Is anybody? Yeah. Do you ever get to the end of it? <laughs> and, uh, and what was interesting is that uh, a, a, lot of the, uh, a lot of the leaders were very type A, type A. They were very organized around their time scale. Uh, and, and, and we asked them a simple question, which is, where are you and what are you doing when you get your best ideas, your real epiphanies? And they said, they said three things. They said, uh, very often I'm not at work. Uh, quite often I'm on my own. Uh, and thirdly, and perhaps the most interesting thing, uh, I'm not trying. They just seem to come to me when I'm not trying. And, and we asked them, well, how much time do you allow then for this ideas process to, to come about? And they said, well, I'm very busy. Very busy. I, it only happens when I'm in the shower or walking the dog or going in the bath or something, <laughs> brushing your teeth, exactly, <laughs> scraping the toothpaste out of the bowl. And, um, and, and this was quite an interesting thing, which was that the leaders that we're talking to, often under such great pressure to get things done, um, and, and uh, people will bear this out, they're often working in environments where they're short of sleep. And, uh, and they would come to us and say, Tell me, who's, tell me a good example of leadership. Tell me a, an organization you admire. Tell me what good leadership looks like. And that betrays, uh, that betrays a model of leadership. Tell, you, tell us who your heroes are. And we see better fiscal management uh, and planning and leadership in a single parent household than we do sometimes in a boardroom. This is not, leadership isn't something that just the rich and powerful do. It's something that everybody can do. And it's, and it's not taught because the four H's of, of servant leadership aren't taught in, in a lot of the business schools. So when we talk about the four H's, we're talking about people are humble and hungry and happy and honest. And, you, and business schools, in my experience, don't teach people to be happy. <laughs> and, so, and, so, and, and this really does matter because competence follows preference. All competence follows preference. People get good at what they like doing. If they're enjoying it, they get good at it. And so consequently, as a result of that, one of, the things that we, one of the things that we see is people taking this very, very seriously and the environment's becoming very stressful because they're quantitative and short-term and tactical and very masculine in the way they're operated rather than thinking long-term, more collaboratively, more empathetically and perhaps more qualitatively. Yeah, in fact, we, we ventured into a very tricky area in the book which is to begin to talk about um, values and also masculine and feminine approaches to problem solving and values. So as one example, uh, imagine a keyboard. And at one end of that spectrum, you have P&L. You have the profit loss, bottom line, very uh, sort of black and white, uh, arguably, but we can argue about it, a kind of very masculine kind of attitude. The other end of the spectrum, you have compassion and empathy, not that those are not masculine, values, but they are, would be seen in most organizations as kind of the soft, nice, you know, feminine end of the spectrum. But when you look at running governments, where does trust come from? It comes from the compassion empathy end of the spectrum. In corporations, where does the, the trust in a brand come from? Always it's from the compassion empathy end of the spectrum. So what we need are more leaders that are not playing chopsticks at one end of that keyboard, which is kind of what we've had. Men and women should be able to fluidly move up and down that keyboard 
and play music, choosing the appropriate moment to focus on P&L and the appropriate moment to focus on the other options, compassion, empathy. This is just a way of thinking, uh, a more joined up way of thinking. And this was, again, a key point we got at was um, this focus on the detail. It's almost like looking at the world through a microscope all the time, uh, which is not very inspiring to people. What we're trying to give our audience here is a telescope to show you the, the, the landscape and to see the stars. And, and this is where imagination and inspiration can now come into play. Imagination is probably the single most underrated but crucial leadership tool that we have. And I personally love the quote from uh, Mark Twain where he says, the eyes cannot see clearly if the imagination is out of focus. And we have so many leaders whose imagination, maybe not even is out of focus, it's just not there. It's just not there. So how do we cultivate this atmosphere of creativity? And that gets into also the question of who's in your team. And so many of us have experienced organizations where the team all looks the same, all educated the same, all sounds the same. I gave a speech for a law firm recently. They said, we're very diverse. We hire from five different law schools. <laughs> OK, so why is it we do diversity? Not because it's nice. It's because it improves the profitability. It's because it improves the performance. It's because it improves the purposefulness of the organization, regardless of what type it is. So once you start to think about, well, what is that diversity that you're trying to achieve? Um, Chris and I joke, I know as a person who gets approached to sit on boards a lot, yeah, I sometimes get the feeling they're really looking for a man in a dress, right? They want to tick that box and say, I got a female here. But do they want me to bring all my feminine skills into that room and to say, well, you know, I think compassion and empathy might be a more important priority right now than PNL. No, 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 no. And, and where does that come from? It comes from treating the board of directors as if it's a club, which in my view is a very 20th century approach. In the 21st century, the board of directors is the conscience of the organization. If it's the conscience, then we have a different approach. And that means you have to cultivate a diversity, not just of gender, but of neuroplasticity, of life experience, of income level, of ethnicity. And that process means you have to change the structure. And we've talked a lot about how you can't hold meetings the same way you used to hold meetings if you want those voices to appear. And nor can you have an orchestra that's conducted entirely of violins. You know, the conductor's job is not to be the best musician in the room. The conductor's job is to get the best out of every musician in the room. And there's this notion of the infallible leadership is means that the, there's, a, there's an idea that somehow the leader has to be the smartest person in the room. And the message from the book is that if you're the smartest person in the room, you're probably in the wrong room. Your job as leader is to make everybody else feel like they're the smartest person in the room. And so consequently, the most powerful words in the leadership lexicon that we saw were the four words, what do you think? The diversity that you have in your leadership group takes pressure off the leader because it allows them to draw upon a range of different views. And, and so it, the, the, the pressure is thus relieved. And one of, the, one of the things we see is an, an, inverse, an inverse relationship between the diversity that exists at the top of an organization and the individual pressure on one person. Mm -hmm. Because it allows, it allows the true skills of, of, of the diversity to be brought to bear. The motto of America, not, for, not my accident, is a pluribus unum. Out of the many come one. And this gets to, again, structure. So. We looked at all the research, and it's clear that typically, not in all cases, but typically, men will put their hand up and say, I'm ready for either a job or for, to answer a question in an interview when they're somewhere between 40 and 60% ready. And women won't put their hand up till they're 100% ready if they put their hand up at all. Most of the time, they'll wait till somebody else says, what do you think? So this means we have to make allowances because as you say, competence and confidence are not the same thing. And maybe what we've been doing is promoting people who are incredibly confident when actually their competence level maybe wasn't where it should have been. 
and people whose competence is very high, we've ignored. By the way, the competence issue it goes even further. It was so interesting in the research, what we saw was um, women tend to double check their work a lot. Uh, and you've got to tell your car story. But when women double check their work to be sure it's right, if you believe that confidence equals competence, then this is a very unconfident person and practically a sociopath you don't want to hire, right? It's, it's back to front. You end up promoting the people who don't do any homework and don't know what they're saying because they go, I know. And the people who are like, I'm just double checking, I'm just double checking. Now, no, they're not competent to hire. So the, your car example is a great example. Well, well I was sitting in a car, a car rental lot trying to practice what I preach and, and uh, gaze idly into the middle distance. And uh, I was watching people coming in renting cars. And, um, and women would come in and rent cars, and they would often have children with them. They put the children in the car. They'd walk around the car, make sure the children were safely seated. Uh, they'd get into the car. They'd adjust the, the, the seat. They'd adjust the mirror. They'd look across all of the instrumentation. And then they'd start the engine. Uh, they'd look around again. And then they'd carefully and slowly pull out of the lot uh, and make their way to the exit. The, the men would walk straight to the car, get in, slam the door, start the engine, and floor it, and go out often squealing the tires as they left the, <laughs> the lot. And so the, the, the question really is, is who, who do you want driving the car? <laughs> uh, and, and so, uh, again, to practice, to practice what we preach, the four most powerful words, what, what do you think? I think we'd like to, to, to hear from you now. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, so, so a few questions for me before we open up, because I'm sure there's a lot of people got uh, got questions out there. Uh, the first one is, is is something that I have difficulty with, which is that this kind of notion of the heroic leader, yeah, and and the problems of that notion. I completely get that, but at the same time, people will often say, and I, I guess it's true, that that the one thing that you can't do without is leadership. That the one thing that's going to turn this school round or turn this organisation round is leadership. So there feels like a tension between this kind of notion where we don't want these kind of notions of heroic leadership, but yet we do know that leadership's the key. And the closest I've got to kind of finding a, a metaphor for this is it's a bit like um, the relationship between the game of football and scoring goals, which is to say, in the end, uh, a critical variable, if you want to win a football match, is scoring goals, right? So you can be completely focused on that, yeah? But actually, Anyone who was wanting to run a football team who said the only thing that matters is scoring goals would, gonna, would be failing because actually that's not the case. And in fact, the very best managers of a football team see the scoring of goals as a byproduct of the whole way in which they play football. You know, so I don't know if that works as a metaphor, but unpack this question of how we avoid notions of heroic leadership when it often feels like leadership is the critical variable. I think for me, there, there are two things. The, the story of the hero throughout history the Knights of the Round Table, uh, all of the Tolkien stories, Star Wars, Ready Player One. This is a universal story and what's always true is that the leader who wants the prize for themselves and their ego, the kingdom suffers. The leader who has the problem thrown upon him and has to solve it not for his own benefit but for everybody else's, the kingdom thrives. So this thing of why are you doing it becomes important. But the second thing is, as Chris said before, leadership is not only for leaders. So for example, you know, I'm American. We have a tricky president right now. And everyone says, there's no civil dialogue, right? And uh, the attitude right now is, either you agree with me or you're either an idiot or evil, right? This is kind of the atmosphere. And people think, well, I've got to wait for the president. And if he's not going to be polite, then I'm not going to be polite. And my view is, no, 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 that is our personal responsibility. We don't have to wait for the president of the United States to be polite or to change. If we want civil society, we have to have civil dialogue. And I can decide that myself, that I will behave in a certain way. And that's a personal leadership stance. So this idea that it's this other person, and they will decide, no, you have power. So, so one of the things that uh, I, I found uh, troubling when doing this book is looking at all of the research that's there, and there's some, uh, we didn't reinvent the wheel here, we actually borrowed quite a lot of, uh, of, of research as well that exists, especially around female leadership. And one of the things that we saw repeatedly was talented female leaders uh, achieving the goals of their team, 
and not achieving personal goals. They would put the team forward, and as long as the team achieved, whether that was the family or whether that was their work unit, that was their criteria for success. And so the masculine uh, approach to this is we have to achieve a goal. And, uh, I, and, and often in, those, in that research, we saw individual male leaders achieving their personal goals, but the team failing. And, uh, and, and this was one of the things that speaks to your analogy about, you know, is it about the scoring goals? Well, actually, what are we doing this game for? Is it, is it, is it because we're, we're actually taking the whole team forward here and we're, and we're happy in what we do uh, and competence, creates pre uh, competence follows preference? Or is it, is it, is it all about the short-term tactical, the goals on the, on the scoreboard coming top of the league? These are very masculine goals. These are quantitative, short-term tactical goals. And our argument in the book is not against achievement and not against the, pr the process of people making profits, but people recognizing that if you made an awful lot of money in the short term and you achieve these goals, then that may not be sustainable in the long term. And it may be that you become so greedy in the short term that you've actually failed to recognize the cost of that in the long term. And, and we found that a lot of the female skills that were, sh were showing in the research were far more strategic, far more collaborative, far more team orientated. More cultural. More and we're not, and we're not saying that you don't have the, they don't have the goal system or the league table, but maybe you just balance it a little bit more. So the, the uh, second one else, uh, question I want to ask is that it, it is about the very nature of books like the book that you've produced, which, 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 you know, which I've read and really enjoyed. But you, know, you could caricature this book as a leadership self-help book, right? But it is in the nature of self-help books that they kind of give you a checklist. They kind of say, this is the way to do things. And I noticed that in your book, the kind of central diagram looks a bit like a compass. And, I, that, and, and that appealed to me because I, I often say to people, what you need in a lot of situations is not a map, but a compass, because the terrain is continuously changing. But I'm just interested in what, what are you trying to say to people here? Because I don't think you want people to get this book and think, okay, if I apply the rules, the 20 rules, and I have got 20 rules, but you know what I mean? If I apply the 20, then I will be a success. So how should people use, um, everyone's going to buy it at the end and get you to sign it. How should, yeah. they, how should they use it in terms of this balance between the fact that you are trying to tell people useful, it's based on the research, but I, I don't think you want it to be a checklist, do you? So I think the, the point that we're trying to make is that, that the, the question here is, is also an illustration of the Western reductionist process, which is that there must be a right answer. Tell us what the right answer is. I want to buy this book and give me the right answer. And the, and, and the right answer is that there isn't a right answer. It can be both things at the same time. Brexit might be good for Britain and it might be good for Europe. You know, divorce might be good for the husband, might be good for the wife. It, it could be both of those things. And, and what, we're, what we're trying to say here is that the, the Western reductionist process has become so geared to there must be an answer, a correct answer to a truth, give us a truth, rather than recognizing that one of the truths may be, maybe we, we should be happy, you know, maybe we should be humble, maybe we should be honest, maybe we should be hungry. And these are, these are not achievable goals, these are values, not goals, so we, we, don't ha we shouldn't have a to-do list, we should have a to-be list. To re and leaders should radiate those values, not just the thinking about the short-term tactical goals. That's actually a good example of what we do say in the book, is to think if, if values are not a thing you can do, they're just a thing you are. So you need a to-be list as much as a to-do list. Um, but the reason we picked as the name of this compass that we came up with, um, and that compass is designed to help you navigate, as you say, on a very fast-moving environment. I grew up surfing in California, so to me, the world economy is just this constantly changing, fluid thing. But people think it's fixed. You know, I'm secure in my situation. Uh, and this leads to assumptions that may not be correct. For example, right now everyone says to me, I have a robotics company, I manufacture robotics. And they say, well, robotics and automation, they're going to leave us all unemployed. And we're going to need the universal basic income. We were talking about that earlier today. And I say, well, we had the first true robotic in 1804, the Jacquard weaving loom. And we've had nothing but more automation and robotics since that time. And what do I see when I look around the world today in every industrialized country and most of the emerging markets? Record level employment, labor shortages. So. We may need what I would call a universal basic incentive, which will be to help people learn in a continuous way, but I don't think we're gonna need to pay anybody to not work. There's too much work going on. So what are your assumptions? And that's why for this compass that we came up with, we called it the Cathera device. 
And everybody goes, what's a cathera? So the history is, in about 1903, there was a shipwreck off the island of Cathera in Greece that was dug up. And they found on it this extraordinary bronze set of gears, a device, and put it into a museum in Athens where it sat until 1962-63, when a physicist called Del Sola passed it on a vacation and went, wait a minute, what? And he cleaned it up and he started to study it and what they discovered is it's the first analog computer and it predates the first clock by about 1300 years. And it, if you turn the dial, it tells you when the next Olympics is coming, all of the eclipses, when will the auroras happen. It's literally a navigational tool based on astronomy. So what it tells us is our lack of imagination, our belief that there were no gear-based analog computer systems before the invention of the clock. No, it turns out substantially before. So looking forward, such and such is not possible. Really? Is it really not possible? What are we assuming and limiting our understanding of the future based on an assumption that's false or out of date? Um, to that end, I might spend just a brief moment talking about one part of the book that I think is really important, which is the technology part, where we talk about this isn't just about um, navigating in the old world in a new way. There is a new world that we are entering, literally like a new dimension of reality. We are now in a world where there's ubiquitous gathering of data, and all these data points form almost a new holographic space that creates for humanity something we've always wanted, which is literally a crystal ball. And leaders and citizens alike need to learn how to conjure forth answers from this space and how to manage in it. For example, banks are already using artificial intelligence and taking the ubiquitous data that you emit from your phone and from your transactions and from when you pass a camera at the shopping mall they can tell when you are about to be divorced. They know before you know, right? Because they can see the shopping patterns of one spouse and the size of the other. Yeah, this is not matching up. Okay, so guess what they do? Draw down the credit limit of the lower earning partner in anticipation of the financial event that's about to occur. Now, how do we feel about living in a world where this is radical transparency and the net now knows more about you than you know about yourself? The net knows more about your organization than you know about your organization. It's a two-way thing. And I'll finish the last thing on this, just to bring it home. The most valuable startup in the world today is an artificial intelligence startup in China called SenseTime. SenseTime is worth six billion US dollars. That's how big the investment is. And what it can do is identify one person out of a crowd of 10,000, the exact emotional state of everyone in that crowd, and if you take the technology and train it on, say, Newsnight, it identifies the microfacial movements that indicate when the person starts lying. What is this going to do to politics? What is this going to do to business? This is radical transparency. So our message in the book is it's not just the old world and we're going to teach you a new way to operate. You need a new way to operate in a new operating environment. So a couple last questions and vote it up. Um, look, I'd be a little bit more political. I know you talk to people in a whole variety of organizations, but you talk to a lot of leaders who work for listed companies. Um, I don't know how many people read Martin Wolf's piece in the Financial Times yesterday, but it's one of a whole number of pieces that basically say that the kind of PLC model, the shareholder model, is just bust. As a structure, it is bust. And one of the reasons it's bust is it does not give leaders latitude to think long term, to be responsible, because it is short term, and because the ownership, nobody actually owns. You, you've basically got an asset that isn't owned by anybody. It's dispersed amongst the whole group of people. In fact, it is now driven by algorithms because it's dispersed by the investment decisions made by algorithms. They know nothing about that company, what it does, what its plans are, whatever. Do you think that that's right? Do you, Because you talk a lot about structure. Do you think that the structure of listed companies is one that has just now become a real impediment to the kind of leadership you're talking about? Well, personally, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a great optimist. I see a, a, lot, a lot of apocalyptic thinking at the moment that we're going to be hit by a plague of locusts and that the, the seas are going to boil and the skies 
are going to fall. And one of the things that, that, that we try to point out is that, yes, there's a lively debate at Brexit going on, and there's a lively debate in America going on about Donald Trump. But we go to countries in the world where there's no lively debate. You're not even allowed to have a different opinion to the prevailing forces uh, that are there. And so, so one of the things about this debate is, is, the, is the context of it. Because one of the things that we have seen is an, en an enormous growth in the capital markets, particularly NASDAQ in, a, in America, 300% in the last five years, which has created enormous wealth and power in uh, technology companies. And yet we see that enormous wealth and power is being reflected upon them by the people that they serve. And so when you look out in the future now, they're deeply worried. People are deeply worried about the potential and success of those companies, not because they didn't make lots of profits, not because they haven't got lots of data, but because people might turn against them. And, and, and when we say the shareholder system is, is broken, it might be broken in terms of uh, financial results or uh, numbers or things like, things like that, but we actually live in a shareholder system. It's called democracy. And, and, when, and when people get actively involved in the systems as, it, as we're doing, one of the things we point out is that you know, if you have a bit of division on this scale, it's a really good thing because people have never been as engaged as they, as they are because people are at each other's, uh, at each other's throats so about, over, over the whole issue of Brexit. They're very engaged. But, there are, but in these countries where there is no debate, then these tensions come up in, in other areas. They start setting fire to things. Mm. Uh, they start tearing people down from power. And, and, and one of the things that the markets operate in is a, is, is a very democratic environment where if the shareholders don't like what's going on, even if they're getting a lot of money in short-term returns, sometimes those funds won't touch them. Take BlackRock, for instance. BlackRock will now no longer invest in uh, certain organizations if they don't meet their criteria for diversity at the board level. So I think that the capital markets are also part of the problem, but they're also part of the solution as well in terms of policing themselves because this change is happening. It's just not always that visible or that fast. And then just finally, maybe Pippa, for you, before we open it up. Um, Michael Sandel spoke here um, on Monday evening, and he, he used this phrase to uh, looking at, at the decline of trust and um, faith in institutions. And he used the phrase, te he used the phrase technocratic neoliberalism. And I think what he was driving at was the idea, and we, so we talked about one example of this, which is the notion of shareholder value, right? So, you, you know, as a leader, you're driven by a number that you've got to hit. But, you know, actually, if you're in the work in the public sector, it's the same. You know, you're judged by Ofsted, you're judged by this regulator. In charities as well, you're judged by numbers. There's this kind of reductionism, the, the imposition of market or quasi-market criteria. And what that means is that leaders can't stand up and say, look, I am the master or mistress of this organization. You can trust me and I will do what is the right thing to do steering this ship. Because a lot of the time, the leaders stand up and say, I've got no choice. Because yeah. if I don't do this, we'll get taken over. If I don't do this, we'll get, uh, I'll be sacked by the government. If I don't do this, we'll go down the league tables. So do you think part of the reason we've seen the dec decline of trust in leadership and, and confidence in leadership, this thing that Michael Sandel calls technocratic neoliberalism? I think there's a step before that, which is what Peter Drucker pointed out, the great management guru. I think he wrote in the late 1970s that all companies, and uh, all companies, let's say for-profit for companies, they have to make a profit because if they don't, they're out of business. So let's just say that's a done deal. You have to be profitable. That's not the purpose. The purpose of the organization must be something bigger than profits alone. So what is the social purpose of your organization? And because organizations are not asking, what is my purpose? For example, I was a banker for many years in the city. And did anyone say, what is the purpose of our financial institutions? They all said, well, it's to make a profit. Yes, but when they gambled too heavily and it cost the entire society their savings and we had to have a financial crisis and a bailout, now people are saying, the purpose that you serve is not in the public interest. So we constrain the activities. So the first question is to ask, what is the purpose? And what you're describing is a means of foisting purpose because they're not asking the question of themselves. And the second thing, um, which also- well, That comes from a very particular viewpoint because that comes from agency theory. 
Yes. But, so it comes from the idea that you cannot trust people who run organisations because yeah. they're the agents and they can't be trusted mm. to act other than self-interestedly. So that's why you have to put all these pressures on them. Yeah. But, but to, and to combine your previous question with this one, I see a big trend that private is the new public, right? People, when they're running successful businesses, no longer want to do an IPO. They don't want shareholders. They want to keep control of the organization because then they can focus on the longer term. And maybe that is part of the solution, as you say, that you change the structure of capital. But the other question Peter Drucker raised, which is relevant here, is also we should all ask whether we're in public service or in the private sector, if I weren't already doing what I'm doing, how would I do it differently if I could start from scratch today? And that question now is even more relevant because technology is permitting people to create new entities without much capital, without big overheads. I mean, you know, in my robotics world, I can create with a fraction of the capital of big organizations and beat them. So this is a really tough question for government to ask itself. If I weren't already doing it in this parentheses, not very sensible way, how would I do it? Because then once you realize, that means you have to change. And people don't like change. Great, uh, thank you for that. So let's take some comments from around the mark. I'll take them in, I'll take them in three. So we've got one, two, three. Yeah, so start here, wait for the mic to come to you. Uh, and then the lady in the middle there, yeah. Very good. And tell us your name, if you could, so that people can... Thank you, Matthew. Uh, Michael Baylor. Um, great. I really enjoyed that. Um, back to the point on Larry Fink and, and purpose. Is the primary job of a corporate leader now the stewardship of its purpose, in your, from your point of view? Or is that too simplified uh, as an approach? Great. Ho hold on to that. Okay. Second one. My name is Alison Mohammed, and I just have a comment, really, about what you were talking about, about profitability. Um, I work for Shelter, which is um, the National Campaign for the Homeless, and what we've seen in terms of the housing crisis is that housing has become a financial asset rather than a, a basic, fundamental human need and right. Um, and that all seems to be about profitability, and I, I just would like to hear your views on, well, what happens to values and where does profitability become totally destructive? And then at the back. Um, you mentioned, sorry, Tom Dennis. Um, you mentioned uh, ego <coughs> and uh, feminine traits. And my organization takes a form of leadership training into organizations, which is based on the, 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 the unsuppressing of the feminine in both men and women. Um, but the resistance to that uh, in, in uh, leaders and CEOs I find is massive because of, uh, of ego and what they fear they're going to lose. Uh, what's the way forward on that? Yeah, three easy questions for you there. <laughs> well, I, I just, I'll take this one up the front. Um, one of the things we talk about in the book is, um, for example, boards of directors. In the past, they served as like a club. That's how they were treated, it's a club. Now in the 21st century, it's really the conscience of the organization. That is to your point, that it changes the role of the leader when they treat the board as the conscience of the organization. So yes, I think that, that you're right. Um, on, on the housing front, you're absolutely right to raise this question of, of what's the purpose, role, function of housing in the economy. And, and should it be in a space where it entirely serves the purpose of generating profits for private investors? And in this country, you've always been way advanced compared to mine uh, in terms of producing public housing, but there's no doubt there's been uh, a decline in that in recent years. And as people notice what is the impact on society, they're starting to call into question. And I think it's healthy, as you say, at least we have an environment where we can ask these questions. We can redefine what is the right way to structure the society. And I don't have an answer to the one in the back, but I'd be keen to talk to you about that. Yeah, go on, Chris. That's, that's one, that's one <laughs> I'll let you. you do that one. <laughs> Men feeling threatened by re re releasing their, fem their feminine side. Well, I've been involved in the women's movement in politics for, for 20 years. And, uh, 
and I, I can tell you from first hand that, that, that there's an awful lot of talent that doesn't get into, into positions of, uh, of leadership and, uh, and power, uh, and, not, and, it's very, and it's causing a great deal of frustration, and it's a huge loss, um, because we automatically accept some fundamental principles which often uh, other people who are not subject to them can't see. So if you've never felt pain, you don't know what pain feels like. Uh, so, so it's very difficult for you to imagine that. But we know, for instance, in the way that, uh, uh, that leadership is projected, uh, confidence is associated with loudness. Uh, height is associated with authority. Uh, often we have meetings where the loudest voice prevails. Uh, there isn't any allocation of time given to people. So qu quite frequently, we can see people who are reluctant to come forward with an idea because they feel uncomfortable speaking in front of a large group of, of people. And one of, the, one of the best things that we've seen about real talented male leadership is that it often displays very feminine skills as well. It's across the keyboard. And the female leadership that we saw often displayed many masculine skills. And, and, and we don't think the answer is a boardroom full of 10 women uh, that behave like men. That's not diversity. What we're saying, there should be a diversity of, of, of thinking. And to, to, the, to, the, to the point about you know, what, what's, the, what's the purpose of the, of the leader or the, or, or the corporation, uh, a, 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 true, a, a true corporation must be about bringing, bringing the potential, liberating the potential out of the people that are around them. So the leader's job is to liberate that level of potential and to do that, to recognize the barriers that stop people reaching that potential. And that could be because they're not allowed or given permission to either have fun or to take risk. And you know, the wonderful thing about the RSA and Matthew's leadership is that this has got a great convening power to embrace new ideas. And leaders can give permission to say, it's okay to be wrong. So we came across one organization that had something called Church of Fail, where they put a white line down the middle of the room and they said, anybody wants to talk about failure, step across the line, there's no sanctions, you can talk about failure. And uh, I witnessed this, and I, I was ex as astonishing. You, had, you heard all these people come across and talking about some sometimes small things, sometimes bad things, but leaders spend a lot of time looking for failure, and everybody's, everybody else is going like this. It's not me, it's somebody else. And yet when you make it okay to admit that they're wrong, then, then th that can be very powerful and so when we're looking for the, the values of the, of the leadership, we have, to, we have to understand that, yeah, profits are important and, and growth is important, but we also recognize that profits and growth are the byproduct of a successful, happy, balanced culture, not the other way around. I've never, I've, I've never seen that work the other way around. Let's take uh, one more round of questions from this side of the room. So there's one there, and there's one there, and there's one there. But they're all men, so if there's a woman on this side of the room, I'll... Oh, good, there we are. And so there's four, there'll be four questions on this side, yep. Um, I've loved what you're saying. It it's kind of Name? fits... Sorry. Oh, sorry, Doug Mather. Uh, fits in with, with the way I've tried to lead over 40 years. Um, and one sort of observation is, is maybe three words that could go in front of your four words, which, is, which I've used a lot, which is, I don't know, or I'm not sure, what do you think? Um, but then the other thing, the, the question is, is do you, really, do you think true leadership was ever what we've been describing as in the last few years? Because if you go back to some of the ancient Chinese philosophers and their outline of what leadership is, it's what you're talking about. Um, so, thank you. Yeah. Uh, where was the next one? So, yeah. um, what structures do you have in your book that encourage the best thinking from the widest diversity? That's my question. And then here. Um, what practical ideas do you have for parents, please, so that they can <laughs> nurture their offspring to be prepared for the technology and all the wonderful things that they've got to encounter? Thank you. And there was one, did I see one other hand? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Hi, yeah, Dino Shea. Um, so just coming back to your point earlier about um, kind of being more open and embracing the maybe perhaps the more feminine aspects of your personality, I see a lot, and you get this where, where there is a toxic boss in an organization, often in the case of toxic masculinity, how would you empower the rest of the team, particularly maybe female members of the team, to improve their emotional intelligence and be able to stand up to someone like that? Great, I've got one last question myself, so you've got three minutes to answer those, so I've got time for mine. <laughs> well, um, I'm the boss. 
very, <laughs> very, well, very, very quickly, one of the most interesting interviews we did was with a, with a, a clergy, a member of the clergy, and um, he was a, a, a running a chaplaincy at a, at a very large university. Uh, ten years ago, he was seeing about one in a hundred students for emotional and, and uh, psychological problems. Uh, he's now seeing uh, around about 30 in 100. There's been a massive explosion in what he called the iPhone generation. And he pointed out that one of the things that they, they don't know how to use in the technology, uh, they know how to use every one of the apps, they don't know how to use the off switch. It just keeps interrupting them all the time. And, and because they're, they, they're surrounded by communica communication, no shortage of communication, but there's no conversation. So without a conversation, there can be no negotiation. There can be no way of uh, resolving emotional problems because there isn't any sort of ongoing dialogue. So in answer to your question, sir, definitely talking to your children and, allow, and creating a space for your children to talk to you, that's one of the best ways of them dealing with the technology because the technology is there to serve us, not the other way around. Mm -hmm. Well, in terms of practical steps, again, we have a number of tips all the way through the book. There are many of them. Uh, but one of them was, in a meeting, you do equal time. You say everybody gets five, seven minutes, whatever it is, which compels the quieter voices to come forward and compels the blowhards to listen. Uh, so, but there's practical things. Um, the Conservative Party in this country some years ago wanted to have more female candidates for the MP roles. And the traditional format was standing in front of the big, you know, sort of town hall, church, whatever, you know, auditorium. And the women at that time were failing in that, unable to create the um, emotional connection with the audience because it takes practice. I mean, I speak to audiences of sometimes 5,000 people. It's a skill. You have to learn how to do it. So they changed the format to fireside chats. Smaller groups rotate the audience through. The person gives the same talk five, six times in one night. Now, actually, they're more practiced every time. Suddenly, the number of females went up. So there are some really practical things like that to do. Um, but I liked also your comment about I don't know and giving permission to not know. We live in a society where the minute you say I don't know, you're under attack. Why don't you know? So we have to come up with a better narrative because nobody knows. <laughs> so uh, we've run out of time even for my question. So um, uh, thank you very much for the questions you asked. I also I want to thank you in particular for maintaining your empathic link to Pippa even after she said, I grew up surfing in California. Because that, <laughs> you know, I think at that point we could have just said, well, we're not listening to you because uh, you, don't have, you, you don't know what it's like to live in London. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> Um, the book, which is a wonderful book, and here it is, uh, The Leadership Lab, it's available outside. You get two signatures for the price of one uh, if, if you get the book. Thank you for attending today. Thank you for attending all the RSA events over the year. Just remains for me to ask you to join me in thanking Chris and Pippa. Thank you. Thank you.